My name is Mike Fry, and uh, I man manage the worldwide development of our wired switches for Aruba. And today I'm going to talk to you about the hardware platform underneath the 8400. Uh, so we have that. So if that's what you're waiting for, you're in the right place. And let's get going. Okay, so some things I want to cover is just goals. What were the goals that we had in mind as we were trying to create this platform? Uh, and then starting to look at what that system looked like, block diagram and, and partitioning, uh, the components, how they fit together, and then we'll go into some of underneath that, the hood and what's really going on. Okay, so goals for the system, if I just pulled up, I mean, what we're really trying to do here is bring a lot more capabilities, not just to core switch speeds and feeds, which you think of for the hardware, but really to enable the software platforms that we've talked about earlier, where it's all software configurable via REST, where we can enable the network analytics via instrumentation, and so we go from there, but dri driving in a little bit, it's a campus box. It's not intended for data center, right? It is intended to bring together a mobile-first environment or a wired environment. Carrier class availability. It used to be I'd go and talk to customers and we'd have a discussion about planned downtime or unplanned downtime. And really the discussion now is no downtime. Um, you know, the network needs to stay up applications are needed, it has to be there. So we look at the uh, five nines worth of availability to get that. Longevity, uh, for a system of this class, it's certainly not something you want to put in and then put in another one and do a forklift upgrade uh, every few years. So we're targeting a good, solid three generations worth of hardware. And that doesn't mean that's what we want, that means we went through the engineering work of looking at how will we speed the backplane later? What sort of things can we fit in there? Have we put in enough power uh, to allow for the future? Control plane bandwidth, cooling, all those systems are sized not just for what's in there today, but what we may do with that box over time. Uh, going through, of course, uh, enterprise high-end, top-end box. Uh, we have uh, the best chips we could find uh, to put in there for this class of product. Uh, very high capacity. I think we're at over 7 uh, billion packets per second on this box. You put it together. And then uh, maybe more importantly, looking in at the, the scale of the resources when the, within the box. You know, if we set this up for routing, layer three, can we get the depth of scale that we want there? If we're setting up level two, policies, et cetera. Can we configure all the detail and the richness that we want on this box? Can we enable all those rules that we've talked about for the network analytics engine? And then go through uh, support the new software operating system. So I've been developing switches for us for a long time, and I'll tell you this development has has changed much more from a here's hardware, make the software run, to here's our software vision, here's the software we're developing, enable that software, right? And it's a, it's a new take, and I think it's worked really well to make sure that this platform is all about that software bringing it to you reliably. Okay. Mike, um, on that previous slide, there's a point there, best in class queuing buffering, which depending on how you define best in class, you think buffering means a okay. lot of things. Does that just mean big or does that mean? Uh, we'll get into is VOQ, right? Yeah. So we're definitely setting this up for very minimal with any headline blocking anywhere. All independent queues, uh, they're deep, so set up to perform well. Okay. I've actually got a question on the same slide. The last bullet point there, a no excuses platform. Could you kind of get into what that, you know, I'm assuming that is the taking all of the above into account, that that was the goal? Okay. Sure. Uh, for exa example, I'm not going to talk all that much about the ASICs today, but we started designing this box around a set of ASICs and then threw the design away because we found that we didn't like the capabilities that we were having and we were having too many asterisks about what we would be able to do with the box. And we chucked them and we started over and did it again. Right? So we want to bring a box that nobody's going to have to have the side conversation in sales. Well. Yeah, I know it doesn't, but you know, look at this. 
I don't want to give you the no it doesn't conversation. Okay, here's what it looks like, just front and back. And uh, it doesn't, okay, it does say it here. You know, I mean, we've done a lot of 10 pound switches and lighter. Here we have, if this thing is built out, uh, it's not something you're gonna sling under your arm and move around. It's a, it's a big box. So eight rack units, 240 pounds, um, set up on the front, eight line card slots on the outside, two management slots in the middle, central. Up on top, on the front, we have four power supplies that are just underneath a nice looking bezel with the logo. So the bezel comes off easily if you're gonna swap a power supply. Uh, with the power supplies being mm -hmm. front access, which is nice for loading, it means that they're now decoupled from the power cords. So if we flip over to the back, you find the four power connectors. Uh, you don't have to remove your cords, et cetera. It can stay wired into your infrastructure while you're uh, swapping or adding a power supply. The other things you'll see on the back, most of the back is consumed with three fan trays. And each of those fan trays has six fan modules. And finally, we have a rear display card um, up in the upper left-hand corner where you can get status, high-level status of the box and the modules that are on the back. Uh, in the front, I skipped just very, you know, a few LEDs for overall box status. And then the management cards themselves have most of that LED user interface. You've got an active copy that says he's active and gives you all the status. You've got one that says standby and everything else is off. Uh, overall capacity, so starting fabric, 21.6 uh, terabit uh, per second. BOQ dynamic, right? So not something again where we're doing a static hash of ports or cards through the fabric. This is going traffic packet by packet, cell by cell, finding the part of the fabric that's available. So the, the capacity of the fabric is all very usable. Uh, I'll get into why we would say this is five nines. Uh, we can talk about forwarding per slot. You've got capacity for 1.2 terabits each direction. So first generation of cards, don't use all of that. And then the fabric, uh, 1.8 terabit to that fabric uh, interface, in and out. Yeah. So I'm seeing uh, eight line card slots, two management slots. I can physically identify those. Where are the three fabric card slots? Ah, good question. Where are those? <laughs> They're actually underneath the fan modules. And we'll get to some pictures that will show that pretty clearly. OK. Is there any oversubscription in this at all? I remember back in the day, certain manufacturers um, so today we have, let's say this card, six 100 gig uh, line cards. That 100 gig line card, if you lose one of those fabric cards, I think your worst case packet size drops to 80% or something. So that would be a case. Um, so. Right. so this is non-blocking assuming we, we got all the fabric cards. Um, correct, for that kind of bandwidth. These cards have like twice the bandwidth of the other ones, right? So if you didn't have the 100 gigs in there and have that fully loaded, you might be fine with two. Right? Oh, oh, I follow you, okay. Yeah. Right. And it's, so it's 1.2 terabits of the fabric from the 1.2 terabit line cards because of overhead or because of future something? Um, you know what, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I don't have the hardware architect with me, so. All right. uh, but just putting that through. All right, let's high level block diagram of the major parts of the system. So your eight line cards, your three fabric cards, they are all fully interconnected, clo fabric. And I, I've shown them underneath this other gray block because these are, if you're familiar with the direct connect orthogonal connectors, these don't take signals from a line card, through a connector into a mid plane, through another connector into a fabric. The fabric card and the line card plug directly into each other. And that's one of the ways that we've gotten from 10, you know, 15 gigabit backplanes to 
you know, ones that are 25 and in the future 50 gig. And so, so that was necessary for that. Your two management modules, um, control plane here roughly just for now, shown as a green bar, connecting to everything. Uh, we can get to every bit of the system. You got a power system, you got a cooling system. Uh, the the non-data plane connections go through the mid plane and some other infrastructure. We can see it in the other diagrams. So in this okay. architecture, and this may be a, a question for the chassis architect, but you sometimes have centralized forwarding and a distributed forwarding. It looks like this is designed explicitly to be a distributed forwarding system. There is, yeah. It doesn't really appear that other than your management and control plane functions, there is a you know, possibility of centralized right. forwarding. The control plane is centralized, the data plane is distributed. All right, we'll go through. All right, so looking at the front, uh, here's an old CAD drawing of what happens as you extract stuff and pull it out. So you have these 10 line cards and management modules uh, that can all come out. I told you you can remove the front bezel uh, behind it, you find these up to four power supplies. Uh, so looking down my list here, uh, one rack unit wide line cards. Um, we support up to 32 SFP connectors in that form factor. There's potential for 24 of a quad SFP uh, form factor and up to 80 of this future RCX kind of connection where the fiber connections uh, are at a higher pitch. Providing 1,000 watts per slot, there's a lot of power, uh, and then cooling half of that. So the potential is some of that power maybe is, is dissipated elsewhere in the system or outside the system. Moving to the back, what you'll see now, this is the first place that you can see the fabric modules. But starting with the fan trays, I said we have three of those. Uh, each of them has two handles. You can pull that tray. It's all hot, you know, pluggable, swappable. So one of those trays could come out. Uh, the box will actually continue to run with that tray out. So uh, the reason you would likely pull a fan tray, if, if any, add the fabric card, or if you had an issue with the fabric card, you remove the fan tray first. This fabric card is buried, right? So it's behind the fan tray, and these handles you would reach in, uh, unclick the handles, swing them out to unlock them, and then draw the card out and reverse to put it back in. Okay, so you got the three fabric cards underneath. I talked about a rear display card. This is not in, uh, a hot pluggable, I, I guess Frank could, yeah, it is hot pluggable. Uh, very little logic on that, not it really intended to be something people ever have to touch, but if you do, you can. All right, we'll get into the rest of that. All right, now you take all these modules and you put them together. Here's a cutaway from the side, and, and I can point out some things that you wouldn't see otherwise. But just starting front, power supplies up front, uh, we're bridging power from that connector uh, over to the supply, and then the supply is regulating 54, minus 54 volts. That goes into some power distribution circuitry to get it to the mid-plane uh, and to the other systems. So there's your power. Uh, your line cards come in. These three connectors, these are the direct connect orthogonal connectors that I was telling you about. So each of the line cards has the connections to the fabric cards uh, that would interface in that way. We also have another set of connectors that will just go to the mid plane, right? This is to distribute the control plane and uh, some power up here. So those connections come elsewhere. Looking at the fabric cards, uh, if we were seeing it from the other side, you'd see connectors from this to each of those slots in the front from every fabric card. Uh, you got the electronics in between. Um, all these line cards, fabric cards, management cards, they're all shrouded. So you pull them out, you don't have to worry that you know, you've got components that you're gonna damage. They're all uh, shrouded both to uh, protect the modules themselves 
and to contain uh, energy and give it immunity. Okay, fan trays, fans, you can see those, we'll see it. Uh, rear display card up top. So that is how we're fitting everything together. All right, just now starting to work through some of the systems. So power system, again, we talk about up to four cords coming into those four receptacles on the back. Those are now wired into up to the four power supply slots in the front. Now your whole system uh, at Highline can power, uh, be powered by two power supplies. So in that case on Highline, you've got N plus N redundancy. Uh, for environments that might not use Highline, in that case, you would go to an N plus one model. Uh, and then one power supply, again, uh, it, just with that, you can get into all the diagnostic functions, the management cards, so you have access to everything else with just that one supply. Those four AC front ends uh, regulate to the minus 54 volts. The rest of the, um, that power is consumed on line cards at various voltages, and they have these local DC to DC converters, they're called to convert the minus 54 volts into a 0.9 volt, a, a 1 volt, a 3.3 volt. Whatever the logic on those cards needs is all locally generated from that higher voltage distribution. Do you guys make 48 volt DC power supplies for it? Uh, we don't. Is there any, any plans for that? Is there any demand for that? Uh, that might be a product line marketing question. Uh, DC power, we want to get into that. Do you see that coming in the future? Or? I, I guess. Okay. 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 Although, how many campuses are running on yeah. DC power? I mean, it's, that's. I've actually run into a few. It's not really yeah. as common, but I have run into Same a few thing. that do have some DC power plants. Mm -hmm. I think only the really keen ones. Yeah, it depends on what part of the world you're in, too. Some, some places, DC power is very prevalent, and AC is not as much, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Okay, uh, all this power distribution, it's not like you plug in a cord and hit the switch and all the power lights up everywhere in the system. It's all managed, like everything else in the system. So front ends will come on. Now we use the management systems to decide, you know, what card is in this slot, if any, will I give it power, will I not give it power? And that happens uh, through that control. And then we've done a lot. Uh, I know my team had a lot of fun trying to verify that this power system couldn't get killed. So you go through uh, with screwdriver or whatever, short this, short that, short that, short that, <laughs> cut that this, fun, cut that. Really. Right, and just, down, above <laughs> down, medic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so a very systematic look at will this power supply, you know, crowbar or power system not provide the power that is needed in any circumstance. Uh, then you have kind of the dynamic look. What happens if power, you know, drops to a supply? That's the easy case. It goes away. What happens if it drops for only half an AC cycle? What happens if it drops for a cycle and a half, right? So we sweep through all, all these different cases of bad power, wherever you want to put this, and make sure that power system will come, come up every time. Okay. I suppose... The idea of having the on-card DC conversion basically means you can create any other card in the future, whatever its requirements are, it's all handed on card, yeah. rather than having a dependency on the power in the chassis itself. Right. right. You're just going to provide one voltage, and it peels off whatever that line card needs. It's almost like the uh, power distribution to homes, right? It starts out at high voltage uh, for a ways. It's more efficient to tr transmit power at a higher voltage. The current is lower and you have less loss in the copper. So that, that was a major factor here. We're moving a lot of power around and we wanted the currents to be lower. Uh, and then the other is just it's flexible, right? So we plug in something later and now it doesn't need 0.9 anymore, it needs 0.8. You know, you just give it what it needs. Right. Okay. Uh, another factor is uh, a lot of the electronics have such stringent needs on what they get that you need to do it right there so that it's, uh, you don't risk a loss. Better protected, you don't pick up all sorts of um, interference or things on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Oops. Manage dirty power better. Yeah, really. 
Okay. So there's your power system. Any questions there? All right, let's talk about thermal. So just a picture here first and show, you know, three fan trays, each with the six fans. Again, the management modules are involved in control to make sure the system's doing what we want. And then there's sensors all throughout the system. So we'll see what we have here. Front to back airflow on the chassis. That's how it's set up. So the fans in the back are pulling air through the entire system. Uh, each of the fans individually replaceable. You know, we, we pick high reliability things, but fans are, you know, on the lower end of the list for uh, reliability. If you ever had a fan fail, you can unplug that module, plug in a new one, and it's done. Right, so if, if for a fan failure, that's your motive of repair. Uh, it's not, okay, so we talked about the fan trays. That's more for servicing uh, the fabric cards than it is for servicing the fans. What temperature threshold does it go up to before it starts powering things off for, for safety? Frank, do you know that one? Mm -hmm. Is this a 40C limit box, I think? Uh, and I think there, I can get back to you. I think we have some grace or configurable grace up above that. But the intended operating model is 40C or less. Gotcha. It's only 104. Uh, these fan trays, redundant power, redundant control pass to all these fans. Again, we don't want anything to take down this system. Uh, temperature sensors. A lot of uh, you know, major electronic components now will have embedded sensors. We will also put discrete sensors on the cards, and then we have algorithms about looking at what's going on in the system, and we can react if we're, we're seeing a problem. Okay, so normal operation, these fans that are, I think they're capable of like 25,000 RPM or something, they're insane. Uh, normal operation, they're probably running at 10K or something less. 6K, right? So the system's actually fairly quiet in normal operation. Not that anybody's going to put this under their desk, but it's good to know. Uh, if there are faults and the system needs to start compensating, then all the fan speeds can start coming up. Higher temperature, they can come up. And then there's an interesting thing, right? What happens if we lose communication, you know, just to see temperatures or something like that? In some fault conditions, we'll just put all those fans at high speed, make sure that we're keeping the box cool. Any questions on a thermal system? Yeah, right. um, how many decibels, how loud does it get? I don't know that one off the top of my head. Like we're talking jet engine, we're talking you must wear air protection and it's officially printed on the material or if you had multiple systems in some failure condition I w and you were around it for an extended period of time, I would have hearing protection. But uh, under and air condition, it seems like all fans will yeah. pick into high at that point, right? Uh, in certain conditions. So, Frank, what, there's some where we can just compensate and do, you know, an in-between step. Mm -hmm. But if all else fails, we're not sure what's going on, there's an entire fan tray missing, these types of faults, you might bring them all up. Sure. Because mm -hmm. you would rather have it loud than off, right? Okay, good questions. Okay, user interface and display. Uh, don't have a lot of detail here for you. But we do have the three different aspects of that that I pointed out earlier. You know, a couple, you know, power's on, system's okay, or there's a fault, or I have a locator, you know, on the central. The management display is where we'll get a more detailed uh, view of all the modules front and back in the system. And then the rear module, we can see the status of things on the rear of the box. Okay, any questions there? All right, we'll move on. 
Okay, platform security. Uh, Michael talked this morning about the security needs for this platform. Um, this is built around the best security models we have. So uh, we have chassis trusted platform modules where we can act verify that this hardware is the hardware that you think it is. Uh, we have multiple copies of that on that uh, rear display card. So if there's a problem with one, we have another, uh, we keep that true. And then when it has to be swapped, then if it ever did, then Frank could get into how we protect it through that process. But I, that's beyond, uh, but words, we do I, give I the- can't get a card that's been shipped with a root kit from some factory because this platform is gonna prevent that when this thing comes up. Correct. Or mm -hmm. intercepted okay. in transit and taken to a special place where a root kit could be added. As a random example. The network chop shop. Yeah, <laughs> chop shop, yeah, absolutely. That's never happened before. It's just hypothetical. <laughs> Does this uh, apply the same principles down to cables and stuff that are being plugged in? I've, I've known one like, oh, we're not going to detect that cable, or that's, that's not an approved enough cable, or SFP, GBIC, whatever you know, nomenclature you prefer. Uh, that one, Frank, <coughs> do we have... I, I know we all identify the type of transceivers or DACs. I'm not sure we'll check via serial or anything else to authorize it. I don't think so. Or it's less authorized, more deauthorized. Yeah. Okay. Um, that one would be a follow up. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, uh, and then just getting into data plane, right? So you guys know better than me all the things that data planes uh, are providing. So we'll go through generic lists. The top level walk away here is a data plane is virtually all hardware, right? It's all in the chips. There's exception corner cases that can get punted to uh, the management control plane. Uh, when that happens, there's the PCI path to do that. But in general, we're programming hardware. The hardware actually will do learning uh, for itself, for Macs, uh, and it will run distributed model, you know, whether it has that or not. Looking through for, you know, for the chips and, and the, the data plane that we have here, the functions that we're providing in hardware, you got traffic management, the buffering is there, queuing. Uh, we talked about the virtual output queues. Scheduling, uh, advanced, discrete there. Fabric path assignment, dynamic. We can take uh, advantage of all the capacity of the fabric. The fault tolerance, a lot of energy has been put into this box around fault tolerance. Uh, and you know, the general, uh, it's not too hard to strap stuff together that's idle or not working real hard and go through failure cases and have it you know, survive. Uh, but to go through loaded conditions, much more complex conditions, and do it over and over and make sure that the stuff stays up, uh, it takes a lot of energy to make that work. What are the QoS and prioritization schemes supported? So we have weighted uh, fair, right? We have, this. Is, oh, I, I actually have, I think, on this, do I have it on the next slide? Oh, uh, no, I left it on the data sheet. The data sheet has some of that that's out there, or? So the, the hardware is capable of just about any of the modern flexible queuing algorithms that, that you can think of, right? So weighted around Robin, weighted for queuing, there's a lot of flexibility there in terms of what can be provided and what is provided uh, by the solution. All right, um, fabric again, high end, we can fragment packets. So also for better uh, quality of service, jitter control, large packets can be chopped into little pieces, sent that way. So you don't start a jumbo packet on an interface, learn that you have a high priority packet that needs to get through there right now, but you've got to wait, right? This is sending through a fraction of that jumbo at a time. Uh, we'll interrupt it, send the high priority traffic, resume the low priority traffic, right? So, so you do fragmentation after ingress. It's sitting on the crossbar ready to move. Yeah, at the fabric, we're essentially it. fragmenting and, and putting the them back together. The other side together. of the crossbar has to be reassembled before egress? Correct. 
All right. All right, and since it is the virtual output queue, you know, we're, we know the state of the universe. We're not putting things out on the fabric that can't fit. We're not sending things to egress cards that can't fit. Uh, we're managing all that in the system. Um, okay, and some of that just pulling back up again. The goals were want to enable software to do awesome things on this box with the telemetry, uh, the software configurability. So the chipset that we're using here has a ton of very flexible resources that can be configured for a particular application. Right? So this isn't something that gets exposed right now to the user, but it gets exposed to uh, the operating system where that stuff, when we understand what the user's running, resources are divvied up, you get choice points of do you want to be heavy on this type of resource, you know, and go through. When it says about a dozen internal database pools, is that like 11? I don't or know the exact number. 12? I mean, I just, it's just the, the term itself. It just leaves me wondering specifically about that. Okay. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how many. It's, it would also get into what would, you would consider a database, mm -hmm. right? So, and we'd have to have that discussion. Well, that gets into what you consider a database because right. you've got the about a dozen internal database polls, that's all. That's true. Uh, tons of counters. Again, we set up rules. We're looking for events and tracking. Uh, Michael talked about, you know, in the Internet of Things. So when I look at data breaches that have happened in the industry, uh, the ones I've seen, it's an IoT device that ends up being the, the entry point into the network and something is set up. So you'd right away think, well, we want to secure and, and have the best security around those devices. Well, we don't always control the devices, right? Well, where we just went. Uh, so in those cases where devices have limited function, we still, on our side, uh, can configure, we can look for patterns, we can see, we can profile a device and see how it's behaving, we can look for anomalies. So we can build some protection around a device that might not have it internally. We've got a question from the internet. Is this your own ASIC or a merchant one? Um, uh, this is not ours, so. Okay. All right. Are you allowed to say any more than that? No. <laughs> Dark darn it. We'd have to kill you. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay. um, there is a lot of special sauce around what we've put in this box. It's not typical for the application that we're in. Uh, we've put together a lot of high-end stuff to bring this box there. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. So I've actually got a question for you around IPv6 and the hardware and the TCAM, because I know in the campus infrastructure, you know, in North America, we've been kicking and screaming against IPv6 for a long time, but mm. I do a lot of global work, and it's just, if you work in Asia, or especially South America, IPv6 is table stakes. It's blowing up, and it's just part of daily operations, and it's not quite yet for us. How much of the hardware design, especially the TCAM and the fabric design, revolved around IPv6, considering we're right on that precipice? I, it was part of the issue. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's table stakes, right? So we know the box it will be in environments where it needs to do IPv6. Right? Okay, I think I've talked about the other points on here. And so we'll go to control plane now. So starting, obviously, the redundant modules, uh, one active, one standby. Uh, Frank's going to go into great detail about you know, how they cooperate with each other, uh, but we have them there. We consider one active, one standby. Uh, the one that is active has full access through the system, um, through you know, a, a PCI bus, we'll talk here, the primary way that we get through the system to all devices. Uh, we have that. We also have a couple lower speed buses that can be used before PCI is up. It can be used as a backdoor. So again, kind of redundant ways uh, to get around the system. We have 10 gig between those management modules where they can do communication. And again, Frank will talk about the kind of things that would be going on there. 
So overall, in, in summary, the hardware platform, uh, it is a large system designed to be absolutely robust. Uh, we have been uh, in test for a long time. We've done things to the box that you would never want to see done to a box. I talked about power testing, dynamics, dropping boxes, shaking boxes, finding the issues that, re that come up, addressing those issues, you know, and moving on. So, so absolutely robust in all the ways that you just described, but you're still going to want me to buy two of them? <laughs> that sounds like a software question. Tom would like you to buy four. He says. <laughs> You'll want four by the time you use it. Okay, that's what we're hoping. Okay. On, on your last bullet point here, the low speed bus. Yes. Fans, power, and identity. What are you talking about with identity? Uh, that would be the trusted platform modules and yeah. getting okay. out to that system. Yeah. Right.